it's one of my favorite quotes. I think John Piper said it. He said, God's love is not him making much of us. It's about him dealing with our self-centeredness so we can make much of him. And that is the love of God, like I said, to get us out of the way so we can see him saying, look what I have for you. It's God wanting us to look at him. And the, the, the concept is, have you ever seen anyone depressed while they're looking at the Grand Canyon? They're, they're not. They're looking at something bigger than themselves. They're looking at beauty and grandeur. And so isn't God good to say, my love is not about making you feel like you're special even though you are to him it's not about him making much of us it's about dealing with our self-centeredness so we can look at the grand canyon of god's love now i'm pretty sure i've taught some of this before been coming here 20 years i don't have that much new material but i'm going to teach it again because we're going to look at biblical humility without which you and i as much as God loves us, won't experience it because we're looking at ourselves and not him. And that, that seems to be the thing that I'm focusing on the most this, this day is fixing our eyes on our Lord and not ourselves. So let me go ahead and pray for us, and then we'll look at what it is to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. Father, we do thank you that you love us enough to deal with our hearts when they're full of self so that we can be full of you. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be the teacher here today. I pray, Lord, that you would speak a word to each heart. You know where each woman is, Lord. You know if they're hurting, they're scared, they're wounded. You know, Lord, if they have troubles in their families. You know about their secret fears. Would you, Father, use your word this day to penetrate their hearts, to let them know that you know exactly where they are? And would you remind them of Psalm 107.20? I sent my word and healed them of all their distresses. So, Lord, we look to you now and pray that your word, uh, would you would watch over it to perform it. And that, Lord, we would hear it, not with a view to take notes necessarily or to get information, but that we would listen with a view to obey so that we'd experience transformation. But only you can do that, Lord. So would you walk in our midst even now with the lampstand of truth, and would you illumine our hearts to the glories and the beauty of your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for a long time, I'm not one to keep up with trends, but for a long time, the whole HGTV thing was the, the open concept, right? So you would, you would take a, maybe an older home, and you would go in, and if you, if you went into an older home, you're going to have to knock down some walls. I mean, there's going to have to be some demolition before there's decoration. You have to tear down before you can build up. And again, walls have to come down to enlarge the space. Now, imagine yourself as a living house, C.S. Lewis said. God comes in to rebuild that house, and at first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing, but presently he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts terribly and doesn't seem to make any sense. He starts knocking the house about, I'm, I'm sorry, the explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you imagined. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage but he is building a palace because he intends to come and live in it himself and to fully occupy it. So what we're going to do this afternoon is look at enlarging our hearts for more of Christ, which means the walls of self and pride 
have to come down so God can fill us with his enabling, strength-sustaining, and joy-filled spirit. Remember, ladies, water always flows to the lowest places, and so does the living water. And I hope to cover this in three parts. The example of humility, the enemy of humility, and the enabling of humility. Now, I'm just going to confess to you all that the subject of humility is one that I feel some measure of trepidation. I mean, to speak on humility is like me saying, um, you know, I, I wrote a book called Humility and How You Achieve It. I mean, that just doesn't seem like it's very humble. Um, so it's, it's always a little trepidatious. As a matter of fact, William Law said this, and I love this. He says, you can have no greater sign of confirmed pride than when you think you're humble enough. So I am grateful to God for the simplicity of the gospel that in my own struggle with pride, which, by the way, I'm powerless to change, all I have to do is to take my eyes off of myself and focus on the transforming example of Christ's humility, which he showed us at the very beginning in the incarnation. In John chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, and think about this, this is stunning to me, that the world which was made through him, he did I'm sorry, did not, did not know him or receive him. And this is, this is mindful of there was no room for him at the end, fitting the gospel narrative that Christ only occupies humble abodes, that the one who created the heavens and the earth with his outstretched arm, the one who tells ocean waves just how far they can advance, the one who directs lightning bolts, the one who causes the dawn. Think about that. The sun wouldn't come up until, unless God told it to. Who knows all the stars by name. Now, ladies, there are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. And there are 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. And almost as an aside, we read in Psalm 147, He determines the stars and calls them all by name. That the one who in Revelation 14 was seen by John enthroned on a white cloud with a golden victor's crown on his head, that this creator, the one who knows all the stars, the one who tells the sun what to do, this creator would make an entrance into his creation as a totally dependent babe, sinking himself into humanity. One writer said this, the cosmic incongruity should stun us all and should be for us a clear message, a clear lesson from the manger. And it's this, that humility must precede everything. Mother Teresa called humility the mother of all virtues. Think about this, when, when you were saved, and I, you know, and I believe, and I'm sure you do too, that that was a monergistic act from God, that God had mercy on you and saved you. But in, the, in, in the, the thought of us coming to Christ, what had to happen first? We had to humble ourselves in recognition that our own righteousness is not going to get us to heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible says our own righteousness, the very best we can do, the very most we can give to to a a charity or the the kindest we can be to another person without Christ is filthy rags. So we have to humble ourselves to salvation and say, Lord, I can't get to heaven on my own. I need your righteousness. And how about in the Beatitudes? Here's Jesus' first sermon. This is his inaugural address. What is the first thing he's going to say? And by the way, this is the, the great lesson on sanctification. What is the first thing he's going to say that's important? He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom. He begins with poor in spirit. 
He begins with the need of a humble heart. By the way, I think this is interesting. You probably know this. The word humble comes from Latin uh, humus, which means soil or dirt. And it means this, that God wants to be, that, that God wants hearts to be softened and enlivened soil from which grow the fruit of the Spirit. That's why we read in James 1.21, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. And if our hearts are hard, that word is not going to sink into them. God wants our hearts to be humble, to be softened soil. God's aim, we have to remember, is not to change the veneer of our lives with some new behavior. You're, you're not going to change your heart just by trying harder to be a good Christian. God wants, his aim is a new creation from the root up so that new habits are the natural outgrowth of humble hearts which from which grows not self-effort but the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to grow as a believer, humble yourselves daily. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Give up your rights. Quit trying to get the last word. Put others before you. Humble yourselves. And if you'll just do that, practice humility. Asking God through the example of Christ to make you like him in his humility, you will grow the fruit of the Spirit. And it's not self-effort. It's you've got soil now that the seed is getting into and it's producing the fruit of love and joy and, and uh, peace and self-control. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, we read this, that Jesus has left us an example to follow in his footsteps. I love that. That's, by the way, why we're called followers of Christ. We're following in his footsteps. And so what I thought I would do is just give you a, a, a few verses on his example. This is Jesus. Learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls who in relation to his father would say, the son can do nothing of himself. He would also say, I'm not come in the world to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. He also said, I seek not my own glory. My teaching is not mine. I've come to serve, not to be served. This is our example. And here we have in Christ perfect example of humility and now I personally am without excuse I can choose to be prideful to demand my way to get angry when people don't do what I want them to do or I can choose this indwelling life I can tap into it through obedience and say I am going to choose to be like my savior and I'm not going to try to seek my own glory. I'm going to seek to glorify God. I'm going to seek to live in such a way that people know how good God is, not how good I am. We can choose that. And you know, when I, when I hear people say things like, I can't, uh, I, 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 I hear Christians say, I, I can't forgive. I, I can't humble myself to forgive. I, I can't seem to let go of this anger. I, I can't seem to let go of this sin that's just, just dogging me. I can't seem to submit to my husband. I tell them, and, and I preach this to myself too, but this is what I say in counseling. And by the way, I'm not a warm and fuzzy counselor. I guess you figured that out by now. But, but I believe people want the truth. And the truth is, as Christians, you and I can't say can't. Because the Bible says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Through him, not by him, through him. We go through the humility of Christ and discover the strength that is ours. 
So you and I, here's, this was a big revelation to me when someone told me this. I can't say can't. I can't, I, I can't say I can't forgive. The Bible says I can. So you know what word I have to use? Won't. When you're counseling people who say can't, you need to tell them that they are being stubborn. You need to tell them that they have chosen not to. Elizabeth Elliot said a lot of what we call struggle is delayed obedience. Well, I think with all my heart that when we choose what God has called us to do, he gives us the grace to fulfill it. Listen to what one writer said about our feelings. Our will, our, our ability to choose can control our feelings if only we are steadfastly minded to do so. Surging emotions like a tossing vessel, which by degrees yield to the steady pull of the anchor, listen to this, will find themselves attached to the mighty power of God by the choice of your will. The moment you say no to your flesh and yes to God, You've just attached yourself to the mighty power of God. And he is going to give you the grace to fulfill, the grace to forgive, the grace to submit. Take that step of obedience and watch God open up the heavens and pour out his enabling grace on you. Well, since God gives grace which is his enabling power. Think about that. God's grace is his enabling us when we take that step of obedience to obey him. And he gives this grace, this enabling power, only to the humble. And only the humble will experience joy and freedom and rest for the soul and fruitfulness in their walk with God. Since that's true, I want to encourage all of us with this gospel-centered truth that God in his love and mercy toward his sometimes self-ruled, proud, and controlling children gives us the opportunity to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And he says, do so, and at the same time, Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. So why is this God's love that gives us this opportunity? Because I'm going to tell you right now, it's a lot better to humble yourselves rather than God doing it. He's giving us the opportunity to do a preemptive strike on our flesh before he does. So it's his love that says, I'll say it again, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you at the proper time. Exalt doesn't mean make you uh, an exalted person. It means ascend you to joy. He will exalt you at the proper time. And in the meantime, you cast your cares on him because he cares for you. He bids us humble ourselves because he does care for us. And ladies, he knows how miserable we are when life is centered on ourselves. I, I just want to ask all of y'all a question. I think I know the answer, but how many of you know a person? I mean, do you know anybody that's happy that's really self-centered? Do you know anybody that's really happy that uh, dominates all the conversations and that waits for you to finish what you're going to say just so they can tell you your opinion? Do you know anybody that's really happy that gets mad when you, when you uh, don't do what they want them to do, that punishes you when you don't meet their expectations? I don't know one person that is full of themselves that really knows joy and peace or even true happiness. So this is the love of God. He does care for us. And he knows that when life is centered on ourselves, we're never satisfied. And basically, ladies, we're always angry because life isn't working out the way we demand it to. Because 
of God's glorious and merciful invitation to humble ourselves, I want to share a humbling word which can take us from the collective maladies of our souls to freedom and joy and filling in a moment. I would like to say this before we talk about this one word. Sanctification, we know this is for a lifetime. It's, that's God shaping us into the image of his son. Because that's God's goal. He wants the world to see his son in us. So sanctification is for a lifetime. It, and it looks like this. You get up in the morning and you open your Bible. And you read the word of God. And you obey him with the light that you have. Every time you say yes to God and no to self, you've just grown. But you and I have to know that even though that's a process for a lifetime, you and I can be set free from a whole lot of things in an afternoon by humbling ourselves. You and I can experience real freedom from bondage of pride in choosing to obey this one word I'm going to share with you. If you remember this teaching, you'll remember this word. It's the word nevertheless. That word's in the Bible 87 times. It is the line between feeling and faith. It is what God tells us in essence to cross over from all the surging emotions of our lives into the obedience to the word of God. Nevertheless. Let me give you a few biblical examples. You remember in the book of Jonah, here's Jonah who is running from God, disobedient to God. He's a self-righteous man. And he ends up, as we talked about earlier, in the belly of a whale. And we know he was at the bottom of the ocean because he said, the earth and its bars are around me forever and weeds are wrapped around my head. Weeds grow at the bottom of the ocean. Jonah thought that God had abandoned him. He thought, I've, I've done it this time. God's through with me now. But this is what he said, with all those emotions screaming at him. He said, nevertheless, I will look again to God's holy temple. In other words, nevertheless, I'm going to look at God again. Maybe he'll have mercy on me. And we know he did. In the book of Habakkuk, in chapter 3, verse 18, uh, and I, I'm not going to go into the whole verse, but the idea here is the prophet saying, there, there's no, I don't see any real evidence that you love me, God. I mean, there's no cattle in the stall. I mean, it, all these things that should mean that you love me aren't here. And sometimes we do that. We look for evidence other than the cross to show us that God loves us. But I love what Habakkuk said. He said, nevertheless, I choose to exult in you. I choose to worship you. I choose to give thanks. No matter what evidence is there or not, you are still God and worthy of my worship. In Luke chapter 5, verse 5, we see one of our favorite characters, Peter, who's been fishing all night long. And he has not caught a fish. And so he comes to the shore and Jesus is there. What does Jesus say? Peter, let your nets down. Well, Peter's always got a little bit of an attitude. Well, Lord, I've been fishing all night long. Nevertheless, and this is powerful, at your word, I will let down the nets. And you know the story. Nets were bursting with the blessing of obedience. How about this one? And this one I can never really say without weeping. In Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, Jesus is in Gethsemane in the garden. Jesus, who has never been separated from his father from eternity past, knows that he is about to become the sin offering of the world. And you know what Jesus said? As, as a matter of fact, you know this, the anxiety of it. 
burst his capillaries and he's sweating drops of blood and he says, Father, if you could, if you could take this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Had Jesus not said that, nevertheless, we would be here with no hope. It was that line that he crossed into total obedience to his father. Not my will, but thine be done. Well, there's practical ways of looking at it for, for us. Uh, I mean, the list is long. I'll just tell you a few. Uh, my husband's not taking leadership into the home. Nevertheless, I'm still going to be obedient to scripture. I'm still going to respect him. And, you know, here's a good idea. If your husband's not taking leadership, don't go up and tell him you're not leading. He, He's going to dig in his heels and just pick up the remote, right? So what you do is you go into your prayer closet and you get on your knees and you talk to the only one who can change your husband. You pray. I heard somebody say this one time. This is so good. In, in regard to the passage we read in uh, the scriptures that says that you can win your husband without a word by your behavior. I mean, God wants you to focus on your behavior, not his. I love the fact that this one speaker said, you know, God has your husband lined up in the crosshairs. Now, we Texans know what that means, right? Because we all pack heat in Texas. But <laughs> your husband, God's got him lined up in the crosshairs. And until you get out of the way, he can't get a clear shot at him. Nevertheless, I will respect my husband and pray for him rather than nag him. A friend let me down. Nevertheless, I will choose to put my trust in God, who we looked at this morning, never disappoints. Someone got the credit I deserve. Nevertheless, I will humble myself under his mighty hand. He'll exalt me at the proper time. Family member hurt me deeply. Nevertheless, I choose choose to forgive someone rejected me hurt me in, in, in that way nevertheless I will look to the one who will never leave me nor will ever forsake me and who will never ever cast me aside you know I, I, I spoke this some years ago at a church up in Virginia I think and the next morning, there was another session, and a woman comes up to me, and she and she just had this 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 look of just this countenance was just bright, and I and before she even said it, I said, "What has happened to you? You just look happy." And she said, "Margaret, I got to tell you something." She goes, I, "I have struggled my whole life with anger. I just I just thought there was just no way out of it. I thought I was just going to be an angry person my whole life." So I'm driving to work this morning, and I, uh, to the church this morning, and I, I stopped by and get a, something from Starbucks. I think I've been there one time. I think it's, a, what do you call it, a big one? Thank you. And so she got a, a big coffee cup from Starbucks, and she's, she put it in her car, and somebody in front of her stopped suddenly, and the coffee went all over her car. And she goes, now, you being the speaker and all, I couldn't tell you what I normally would say. So she said, but you know what I did? I stopped right there and I said, nevertheless. <laughs> and I said, well, what was your nevertheless? <laughs> well, nevertheless, my husband's a nice husband. He's going to clean this up when I get home. <laughs> but I want to tell you why she was so happy. And I'm going to use her language. She said it broke the spell of anger in my life. You know, every time you and I say, nevertheless, a wall of pride comes down and Christ fills the space with grace and peace. He fills it with himself. The only hope we have, Andrew Murray said, of a de decreasing self is an ever-increasing Christ. Well, a couple of ways that you and I can choose to humble ourselves. I can choose to humble myself by opening my Bible because to do otherwise is declare my self-sufficiency that I really don't need God. 
And I, I, I always say this because I don't want this to be uh, this relegation of having a quiet time. I'm going to say something about quiet times. If you miss a quiet time, God is not disappointed in you. He will never be disappointed in you because his son is in you and he, he loves the son as much as he loves you and vice versa. But he's disappointed for you because of what your day could have been like. You could have had love for that person that was hard to love. You could have had strength. You could have had courage. You could have had peace because that is... Uh, the, reading the word is a divine means of grace that heaven pours out in us all these things that we need in life. And when we close our Bibles, God isn't disappointed in us. But he's disappointed for the fact that we'll be lacking in that day. I can choose to pray instead of control. How about that one? You know, if you're not praying, you're anxious. Because when you pray... You're going to the only one who can change your, that, the person in your life or your circumstances or give you peace in the process. Uh, one, one author said one of the great uses of Facebook and Twitter in judgment will be to show that prayerlessness was not for a lack of time. If you've got time to get on social media, you've got time to get on your knees. I can choose... To quit feeling sorry for myself. I mean, enough said. I can choose to face pain rather than numb, numb it or run from it. I tell you, ladies, I think we in this culture that hasn't really endured much, we certainly haven't endured much persecution, but get ready, it's coming. I think we've become committed to relieving the pain behind our problems rather than using the pain to wrestle passionately with the character and purpose of God. Feeling better for many of us has become more important than finding God. I can choose to take up my cross daily. I love that. It's, you take it up daily. Uh, one, one writer said, every time I'm confronted with a crucifixion moment, I can choose to lay down my self-life, choose to surrender my pride, my expectations, my rights, and my demands. I can choose the way of the cross and die to the demands of the flesh. I want to say something about the moment you and I die to self which, again, could mean so many things. It could be just the relinquishing of what you think you have a right to. It could be waiving the, the temptation to punish somebody because they didn't do what you wanted to do. It could be just saying no to, to, the, to the flesh that gets angry. Every time, and this, this blows my mind because it would settle so many problems in our hearts and souls and families. Every time you and I die to self, we will experience from that moment resurrection power. If you and I will just get at the business of going to the cross and dying to self, God will do the rest. God will give us the resurrection power to do what we've been trying to do in the flesh our whole lives. It will be God at work in us. In that same power that raised Christ from the dead is active in us when we go to the cross. That's a powerful, encouraging truth to me, and I'll tell you why. I don't have time to tell you how messed up my life was. I went to counselor after counselor, and counseling's a good thing if it's got God in the center of it. But the counseling I went to wasn't, and it just, it just kept making me lose hope because I didn't think there was any answers. When I discovered that I, I, I could stop running around frantic trying to find answers and just go to the cross and watch God change me from within, it revolutionized my entire life. Well, everything that you and I are looking for in this life, and let me tell you what we're looking for, whether you know it or not. We want peace. 
you want contentment. You want to be able to say, I'm happy with what I have. It's this, not this constant craving for something more. You want joy. You want that, that inner inward blessedness of joy. You want the power to love people that are hard to love. These are the things that we look for in life. And I'm going to tell you, all of them are available to us right on the other side of the cross. You and I can live on the self side of the cross and not experience all that God has for us. We'll still go to heaven when we die. We're still loved by God. But we're sure missing out on the blessings of being his child when we are self-serving, self-centered, selfish people who refuse to lay down our self And this is what it looks like. This is what God says in his word, that you and I must be poor in spirit, humble before God, before we can enjoy the riches of the kingdom of heaven. That Jonah had to spend three days in the darkness, in the belly of a well, before God could bring him to deliverance. I just got to say this because it always fascinates me. I love the book of Jonah because, you know, a lot of people might relate to, you know, wonderful characters in the Bible. I relate to Jonah. And 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 here's Jonah. Uh, he's, he's in a bad place. We know that. But in this bad place, he prays. I think it's in chapter 2. And the whole chapter is his prayer. And in the whole chapter, guess what pronoun is there? I want to say 22, 23 times. I, me, and my. Jonah's, Jonah's still not delivered. But this is what I love. The moment Jonah said something, prayed to God, it wasn't about him. He said, salvation is from the Lord. God commanded the whale to let him go. That's when you and I get deliverance, when the I, me, and my is not paramount in our lives, but God is. That David had to accept responsibility for his sin before he could shout for joy. In other words, quit calling, quit saying that your sin is a result of of your past or your parents. If if you're a born-again Christian and have the living God in you, you're responsible for your behavior. Quit blaming it on everybody else. When David took responsibility, he said, my sin, my iniquity, my transgression, and threw my sin in there one more time for good measure, that's when God began to free him. That Hannah had to relinquish an idol before her countenance would be glad. That the woman at the well had to leave her water pot behind before she could be a witness to the world. That the three Hebrews had to go through a fiery furnace before their bonds were broken. Remember the old hymn, The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. So what is the lesson from the incarnation? That there must be a humbling stable of straw before there is an exalted throne on a white cloud. There must be the cross before there is resurrection power. Um, I'm sure you all have heard this illustration too, but some years ago I was asked to uh, speak at a retreat, and a lot of times people already have the retreat idea like loved, which was, by the way, one of the best ever. I love that. Uh, This one was, uh, oddly enough, called You're a Princess, Treat Yourself Like One. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure how I'm going to get past this one. Because our, our problem is that we think we're princesses. And we're on the throne. And you better do what I want you to do or it's going to be ugly, right? But I knew this woman very well. And she wasn't trying to, you know, do anything unbiblical. But I, I, I just said this. I, I will teach it. I will teach the, the five crowns of heaven if you'll let me teach the cross first. And she said, that'd be great. So I get there, and there's a stage like this, and there's a large cross behind me. And I want you all to know that 
there were about, oh, maybe a couple hundred women there, and every one of them were issued a tiara when they came into the building, and I was about to tell all of them, you ain't princesses. So I, I, my whole life flashed before my eyes when I, I saw all of them out there with their crowns on. And um, so I, I got up there and just depended upon the Lord as much as I knew to be, and I started teaching the cross. And I, I said, down here we're servants. Our crowns are in glory. And I spoke of the crown of thorns that our Lord took for us so that we could have resplendent crowns in glory. And ladies, I'm going to tell you what happened. Women started getting up. And I thought, this is going to be the worst disaster. <laughs> they are heading for the door. They want their money back. They all started to come up behind me to take their crowns and put them at the foot of the cross. And God moved that day. It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with teaching the truth. Are y'all with me on that? All right. Well, let me wrap up with the, well, that was the first point. Let me, I got two more, but they're a little bit, a little bit shorter. Here's the enemy of humility. I think the number one enemy of humility is entitlement. If we walk through life and our basic orientation is you owe me, you owe me a certain look when I pass you, you owe me a correct order at the restaurant, you owe me understanding and to fulfill my expectations even when I haven't voiced them. If you feel you were owed a husband who meets your emotional needs, good luck with that. <laughs> I'm not married and I know that. <laughs> Children who always obey, a certain standard of living, good health, companionship, romance, to be recognized, to take revenge when you're wrong, and the list goes on and on. If that's how you walk through life, demanding payment for satisfaction, and if it isn't paid, you get mad, you know you need to humble yourself before God. You know, I, I hope I have time for this because it's just so important. In Romans 1.14, Paul said this, I am a debtor to all men. Think about that. I'm a debtor to all men. It's because God, Paul knew he was a sinner. As a matter of fact, he called himself the chief of sinners. He knew he owed all men what God had given to him. And I thought how this would change our lives, our relationships, the body of Christ. Instead of grudges, we forgive. Instead of being critical, we're patient. Instead of punishing, we give grace. Instead of rejecting, we love. You and I should get up every day as debtors to all men. It's not what they owe us. It's what we owe them. Because of all that God has done in our lives, we need to pour that out on others. Dear ones, those who learn of Christ, his humility and his meekness no longer seek what is owed them. They've been able by the spirit of God in recognizing what they already possess. And listen to this. An indwelling and comforting Savior. His promises and pledge to never forsake us. His lavish grace and rich mercy. His hand in fearful places. His light in darkness, hope in sorrow, cheer in discouragement, strength in weakness, solace in grief, his ever-present help and his never-failing love. This is the attitude of the humble. They don't grasp. They don't demand. They relinquish. And in doing so, they inherit it all. So what is the solution of this joy-destroying disease of entitlement? And I'll close with this. The enabling of humility, I believe, comes from being stunned at the grace of God. When you and I deserved to go to hell, God intervened and had mercy on us. God, for nothing you have done, 
in his mercy, chose you to be his child, chose you to take you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son. No one in this room deserved to go to heaven. God had mercy on us. And when you and I get up every day stunned that God saved us, that God would save someone like me, a lost, immoral, drugged college student that had gone as far below as you can go, not only with immorality with men, but immorality with women. That's as far down as you can go because it just defies the face of the creator. If God can reach down and save me, I need to live every day as a debtor to you. The grace that God gave me, I should give to others. And I want you to know I have never gotten over God saving me, ever. I'm stunned at it. It's amazing grace. He saved a wretch like me. I should be going to hell. I should be here with no hope. But I am sealed by God for all of eternity. That's my future. Ladies, I want you to know that God does love you. You are loved. You'll experience it a lot more fully if you go to the cross and you die to yourself. And I will tell you in closing, like I always tell you, I love you very much. Coming to this church is like seeing family again. And uh, I just want to thank you very much for having me.